Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 384 for Monday, May 22nd, 2023. <music> Greetings, folks. And welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include HelloFresh.com slash Gig Gab 16. That's where you'll go and use code Gig Gab 16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. We'll talk more in depth about that in a little bit. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Hey, Paul, I mentioned a few weeks ago that we I was going to set up a mailing list for us here uh, on GigGab, and and I did that, and but I have not talked about it. We have not talked about it since I set it up, and uh, it's up. It's working. Those of you that have signed up at GigGabPodcast.com get our episode notifications, which include all the show notes and everything. You get those uh, once a week or, you know, whenever we put the episode out and all that stuff and you know that it's there. So go and sign up. We're not spamming anybody. I mean, there's not nearly enough of you to like, you know, sell this list for millions. We tried, but um, it's it's not, you know, it's not there. So it's so no spam. Someday. Someday. That's our exit scam, Paul. When we get enough on the list to sell it, then we'll just sell it and we'll be done. That'll be the end of it. Yep. Until then, we will be the... uh the most responsible stewards of your email we possibly can be. Uh, yeah, I, um, I had a couple of gigs this weekend. <laughs> uh, Friday night's gig was a, a fling gig outside and uh, it went really well. It, we played two sets. People were into it. Uh, you know, the sound outside was good. The vibe was good. The weather was good at the end of the gig. Uh, one oh one thing we did for the sound, by the way, we put a subwoofer on stage. Nobody on stage is using amps anymore. Everybody's going direct. So two guitars and bass go direct. Our keyboard goes direct. There's live drums on stage. That's it. We put a subwoofer on stage and I cranked that thing up. And man, that made a huge difference in terms of feel on stage for mm. all of us. Yeah. So yeah. The, miss the missing moving air returns. Exactly. It was delightful because it wasn't, you know, I mean, everybody was on in-ears, so it, it like we didn't need to worry about like monitor wedges or anything. I guess Aaron wasn't. Aaron was on a wedge and he said it sounded great to him, too, because he got what he needed out of the wedge and yet could still feel the, you know, the thump of the, the low end. So if you're not doing that and you have the opportunity to do that, I highly recommend putting a sub on stage. But uh, at the end of the night. One of the funniest moments I've ever had, Paul. There was this woman who was, you know, having fun, probably had a few extra drinks or whatever, which is fine. She came up and she's like, oh, are you guys going to play more? And we're like, clearly, like things have already started breaking down at this <laughs> point. You know, it's like it's a it's a hard no. There's zero opportunity for this to happen. And then she's like, can I play your drums? And I'm like, Ooh. well, yeah, I'm like, no, no. Uh, and she's like, well, can I at least have a drum stick? And I'm like, sure. So I gave her a drum stick. And she's like, can you sign it for me? I'm like, you know, I got, okay, sure. So it's it, it's nice that she wants that. So I, I do, I sign it. And she's being a little bit obnoxious. It's not like, she's not like fawning over the band. She's just wants to, wants attention, right? I was like, okay, whatever. Like, you know, this is what we do. Fine. So I pull out a pen. I sign the drum stick for her. I give it to her. In the meantime, while I'm signing it, she grabs uh, the tambourine that Mike, our guitar player, plays during a couple songs and starts shaking it, not making any sound. <laughs> I, I hate to laugh, but I'm, I'm laughing and I'm going to keep laughing. Uh, I'm not proud. <laughs> Paul, she said one of the funniest things I've ever heard. She said, <laughs> she said it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's, she's right. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I commented, uh, we had our, our friend Ian helping us with the sound and kind of doing some roading for us. And he just happened to be standing near me. And we sort of both broke into like tearful laughter at this comment. And I turned to Ian and said something I never would have said to this woman, but I'll say to all of you, because I think you all get it. 
I said, you know, I think it might be more of an error between the ground and the tambourine than perhaps the tambourine itself. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yep, that's what she said. It doesn't work. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Broken. It's must. It therefore must be broken. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, doesn't work, Paul. Doesn't work. So. I've got an interesting situation in my band life. I thought I'd share with you yeah, and everybody man. out there in, in gig gab land. So <clears throat> one of my guys has just encountered some health issues and we're about to get real busy. Like this weekend, we're about to get real oh. busy oh. and he's going to be out for eight weeks. Oh, so, you know, it, he feels terrible. feels like he's letting us down. But, you know, health first and family of first always, right? It, 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 like, are things going to be, it, once the eight weeks are up, it does the way that it looks right now, are things going to be all right? And, and Yeah, okay. right. As of right now, you know, great. I talked to him and... and um, great. And, uh, I'm glad you to know, hear that. It, yeah. it, it, could, it could accelerate or it could take longer, I suppose. But sure. um, anyway, you know, the point is, is like, so I got, I got the message and... You know, my first thing is, is, oh my God, my friend. And then yeah. your next thing is like, oh my God, these gigs. <laughs> so, you know, I went into immediate mode and, and I called Russ, who used to play for us. Yeah. And um, Russ was amazing. And he was like, absolutely, you know, anything for, you know, our mutual friend and anything for the house rockers. So he had a great attitude about it. And, you know, I, I was immediately good thing, man. Good. But then he looked at the calendar and there were a couple, including one next weekend. That he couldn't make. So I called the guy who I play with down here in the Central Coast, oh. who has always indicated some interest in playing with the big band. And, and I said, well, the, inter the opportunity has come about. You into it. You thought about it for a little bit. And he said, yeah, I'm in. I'd love to. Ooh. So I'm he glad he said yes, show. because I, I have a feeling your next phone call might have been to New Hampshire. And no, that... no, no. New Hampshire was almost the first phone call, but I didn't think you'd want to live with me for eight weeks. So, you know, I just... <laughs> yeah, my fans here might not be so happy if I wasn't living here for eight weeks. Not to say you're what your wife would say. <laughs> I don't I'm not sure my wife, my wife would have a reaction. I'm not sure it would be the same as my band's reaction. <laughs> That's funny. Anyway, so I called Randy. And uh, and Randy said, I'm in. And so he's woodshedding. And, and the thing about Randy, the reason I called him, not just because he indicated he wanted to, but I play with him down here and I've been more than impressed with his ability to quickly learn and retain information. Like, That's key. Like, yeah. It, it was, it's it, it actually one of the most adept guys I've ever played with at doing that. And, you know, he shows me that every single time that we play now, again, I don't know. He, he said he went right into the woodshed. I'm going to go sit with him Wednesday night. We're going to walk through the set. You know, we first, the process was first I said, I'm all of our songs. And remember we learned, you know, a dozen new songs with our existing guy. Yeah. And, and, uh, and some of them are kind of involved and, and the rhythm section is putting the work on those. And the, and the rhythm section was great. They're like, no, 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 you know, yes, it might be sunk time. Maybe we'll get it back. You know, when, when our guy gets back, but, um, uh, you know, don't worry about it. So anyway, process one, send the list. And w which of these do you know? Yeah. I say send it to Ru Russ as well, right? Yeah. And um, Russ, being Russ, still has all his notes and set lists from when we played with us. So that for, for that the, actually, I feel really good. For the record, so do I. Although I'm uh, thinking I probably shouldn't be admitting that yeah, right now. Yeah. 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 Be careful what you, what I you know. share. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to go. So first agree to a, a list that gets us close, uh, almost had enough material, you know, that he was at least passingly familiar with. Then we decide what we can fill in with. Then he hits the woodshed, two or three phone calls about this. Lots, you know, we don't do anything, hardly anything straight to a record. Right. So a lot of videos of us, you know, and then uh, Wednesday I'll go over there and we're going to walk through the set list. The songs that, he starts the songs that he has to be in on the start, yeah. you know, endings. We got to, you know, we've had subs in the past and we can drag guys through endings, right? You know, that yep. that's not as bad. It's not as but, bad. Um, You're right. It's better when they're tight, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, the, you know, this first gig that he's going to play, it's, it's our first gig. It's the, it's, mm. it's the first gig. Mm. So um, that's what Randy's going to play. And um, this is a, a travel gig for us. It pay us really well. 
and we've, you know, it's been booked for a year. And so, you know, they love us and we want to give them a great show. I think we'll be fine. I mean, we just, we kind of lean harder on the stuff that, that is more familiar. And, and I'd say 75% of the show, he's going to be just fine on. And 25% of the show is, we'll see, you know, it, it, it'll be fine. Probably, you know, there's that whole thing about how much the audience really recognizes versus how much you recognize on stage. So, you know, we'll have a little bit of that going. I think it'll be fine. It'll be an interesting conversation when I get back to you, you know, on next, next week. Um, but, you know, about 13, 14 gigs over the next eight weeks. And, uh, and, uh, you know, wow, we'd been rehearsing, we were rehearsing for plan A and immediately have to switch to plan B and plan C. Yeah. So I do want to take a moment and wish my guy, Don, you know, a fast healing. I've talked to him on the phone a couple of times. The whole band Good. has been checking in on him. You know, he's, He's a great guy, and he feels like he's let us down. Which, Don's a heck you know, of a he, guy. I, I got to meet him when guy. I was out there last year. Yeah, he's yeah. a heck of a guy. Yeah, and actually, the, the the connected part of this is, so our bass player and, and Don are, are quite close. And w- when I saw the, we did a vocal rehearsal the other day. So you know, the four of us in the rhythm section that sing, and the bass player had said that um, word had gotten out, and that pro drummers from all over the area were like, "Hey, anything I can do to help out for Don?" You know, that's I'm there for him. So yeah, so he's getting a lot of love, and hopefully that'll help the recovery process. He's itched to play, and he's just such a fantastic player. So Don, we love you. Get better. You know, your chair will will be kept warm by good guys, but it's your chair. So you know, get ready to come back and and finish the summer up with us. Yeah, man. Ah, that's great. That's great. I'm glad. I'm glad it sounds like everything's going to be all right for him. And um, yeah, yeah, all that. I was. uh I was thinking about the time earlier, just today, I was thinking about the time that I, I, you know, put in the work and came out and played with the house rockers because one of the songs, I, I'm sure there's a ton of songs that we, I played with you that I play with uptown, the kind of party wedding band that, uh, that mm-hmm. I play with here. But one of them is born to run. And I was, we've got a gig coming up in about two weeks. We had a rehearsal yesterday, which I'll talk a little bit about in a little bit, but, um, one of the songs that band plays is born to run. And mm-hmm. so because this gig's coming up, I've just started uh, just when I'm in the car or whatever, just playing the playlist of the songs for the gig. Cause it's the first gig that this band has played since before COVID. And it's the first gig we're playing with a new bass player and a new singer. So there's quite a few new songs on the list. We've only got to play two sets. It's going to be fine. Like all of that. But you know, I want to make sure these songs are in my head. And when born to run came up, you know, on the list in the car today as it was, it was playing along. I realized, you know, this is one song that I have never put any energy into learning. And yet, and yet I know it cold. I, all I have to do is play along with the radio in my head and I get all the drum fills. Everything's where it needs to be. Like there's zero concern. I have one little note in there where it's like, you know, after this, wait for Paul to count one, two, three, four. Right. Like that, like, because I, I have the notes from when I came out and played with you. That was the first time I played born to run. But even then I didn't need to prep it. I just made that one note, you know, like, okay, this is what's going to happen here. And then, you know, wait for Paul to count in the, in uptown. I'm actually the one that counts that, but it still says on my chart, wait for Paul to count it. I, I know the difference. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm with you at all times. I, that's the thing, (laughs) but it, it's just interesting. You know, I was thinking about it today how some songs just become part of your, your DNA. Like they are in there. And I, of course I've listened to the song, but I, I never listened to it to learn it. And yet I like, again, I just know it cold. I know it better than some songs that I have listened to, to learn. Let me ask you a question. You know, it cold copying the licks that the original guy did. Yeah, man. I know all those drum fills and everything. I don't know what I like. It's not something I ever sat down and said, I want to learn the drum parts to this, but I know them. It's just bizarre. I, 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 I yeah. need to hear an eye because, you know, the original drummer from that is a drummer named Ernest, Ernest Boom Carter, a jazz drummer. It's Boom Carter. I know. And there's those, <laughs> those cool little hi-hat fills where it's the, yes. off, the like the offhanded stuff in the, you know, it, it happens twice, once in the sax solo and once kind of after that. But yep. And I think the story is that Max Weinberg said he couldn't, he couldn't cop those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
as I was listening to it today, I was wondering, I'm like, can Max play? I'm, and then I thought, of course, Max can play this stuff. The guy's a world-class drummer, you know, but, but yeah, those are fun licks. Those are like Neil Peart licks, right? You, you know, those are like, like things that I would have learned playing Rush songs. And maybe that's why it caught my ear whenever it did over the years and, and just stuck with me. But yeah, man, it, it's the only part that as I was listening to it today and probably for the first time in a long time was the end, the drums just do this eighth note buildup thing that I haven't ever really copped that. But, but that's the one. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. I've never really paid attention to this part. I'll if do that. Some drummer right. told me that, he, you know, if someone was really nonchalant and said, Oh yeah, born to run, no problem. I would give him the stink. I, I mean, the, the I'm glad I didn't say that to you before I came and played with you. Cause we played this song together twice and yes, and it went fine both times. And I never had to learn it. But there's actually a lot. It's not like a straightforward form. And, you know, there's. No, it's like a prog rock song in terms of the form and all this stuff. Like it it does not. Yeah, no, you have to know the song. You can't just fake your way through it. That That's what I'm saying. It's just, it's weird that some songs, and, and I, they're different for each of us, of course. But, you know, Born to Run is part of the Great American Songbook for sure. Yeah. It happens to be written by this guy named Bruce Springsteen. I think you'd love this guy, Paul. I think cool you name. should check him out. It's a cool. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was just interesting as I was listening to it. And I was like, man, yeah. I, why do I know all these fills? Why do I know all these parts? Uh, I find actually that's the most fun music to play. When literally there's no thinking, it just no. oozes out of you. Yeah, you just play it. Oh, I mean, that's my goal with any band. Originals, covers, whatever. I want to get to the point where I've, and with originals, it it tends to happen almost automatically uh especially if you're you know there for the collaborative process yeah. of like crafting the songs but it, you know i i love when i'm at that point where at a gig i don't have to think i just know the song and i and, play there's the two song. flavors of that though right there's there's the there's the songs that have just made it into your dna then there's and you know and they live there Th- those yeah. to me are the most pleasurable but the ones that you have to woodshed and there's always that one part that you had to really work hard on. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, that's a different type of, you know it. Yeah, but, but you don't know it. Head. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. If you have any doubt that there's one, that, oh, that one lick, oh, that one note I got to hit. Oh, you know, whatever it is. Yep. That's different than the songs that just flow. No. Right? And that, that totally like born to run, you know, thinking of the uptown set. Cause we just had that rehearsal yesterday. Thinking of that one, Born to Run is one of those where it's like, oh, we're playing that? Okay, great. You know, two, three, or two, da 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 boom, and we're is in. Is everybody in the band like that? With that song, yeah, it's fine. Uh, but, but like. I guess you live in the Northeast. It's, 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 uh, it's required. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, everybody, everybody knows that song. It's fine. But mm. I, but I don't want to say that it's, it's in everyone's hands. Like it, like it is for me, for whatever reason, that song's in my hands. I just, I just enjoy listening to it and watch my hands play it. You know, it's, 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 it's in me at that level. I think, I, I think our bass player had to put some time into learning it. And I think he's mm. still, you know, needs to pay attention to what section of the song we're in because, like we were saying, it's, it's not just, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus for like, it's, it, there's weird little twists and then the feel changes and the whole thing. But, um, but that journey tune separate ways, I know that song too, but like those fills are not in my hands. I, I, I That's have Steve to Smith those. stuff, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. A, there's a reason for this. I'm, I'm not, yes. I'm not saying this is a surprise, <laughs> uh, but it is, you know, it's one of those things. So, um, you were talking about respect for your drummer and, uh, and Don really, I, I hope all goes very, very, very well for you, my friend. Um, I was, I had put this on the list last week. Um, and, but it still rings true, even though we know the answer to the question of who is the Foo Fighters drummer. I'm, I'm hoping to see the Foo Fighters two nights from now. They're opening their tour in, uh, in New Hampshire. We wound up buying tickets on StubHub uh, for actually a, a quite a fair price, I'm hoping that they work because the Foo Fighters said that that there were no ticket transfers for this. But I think the tickets that were sold through the fan club uh, did not qualify or, or were not subject to the no transfers thing. I think we're all right. StubHub thinks we're all right. But the important part is how much respect there was 
and still is in the music industry for Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. God. <laughs> what did you just do? Like, what, what did, did I just you just do? do? Sorry. I, well, I have a Taylor Swift thing story to tell too, but Taylor Hawkins and, uh, and the Foo Fighters in general, where certainly there were many people in the industry who knew that Josh Freeze was going to be the, the drummer on tour with the Foo Fighters this summer. And no one said anything until the Foo Fighters said something yesterday, right? They made the announcement and then the industry felt free to talk about it. But I, I just, I really loved how there were zero leaks about that. There were people speculating and looking at, okay, well, the offspring picked up a different drummer to play the summer tour, which means that Josh Freeze is, you know, I mean, there were people kind of on the outside of it, calculating all of this stuff and figuring out who was going to be the drummer. And that's fine. But no one that knew leaked it. And, and it kind of reminded me of when Neil Peart was sick and no one leaked it. Like it was a shock to most of us that he had passed away and none of us knew that he, you know, he'd had brain cancer and yet lots of people knew but nobody, nobody shared it. And I, I love that, that when there's that respect in the music business, cause it's, it's an industry full of gossip and rumors and, you know, all kinds of things. And I love it when there's those those sort of asterisks that say, yeah, but not on this one, leave this one alone. I like that. And, uh, and, and I'm really stoked that it's Josh freeze playing for the foos. Cause I think he's the right guy for the job. I've thought that ever since they did those, uh, you know, those, those tribute shows for, for Taylor, I guess since I, I misspoke, I should share that because I had a monkey fist gig on Saturday and a fling gig on Friday, um, I, and, and those two nights and Sunday night, Taylor Swift was local here. She was playing down at Gillette stadium. I got to tell my, my stupid Taylor Swift joke two nights in a row. And that was, I thanked everybody for choosing to come to see us instead of Taylor Swift. And also, and this is a thing that we were so thankful for and really could never share our full appreciation for was that we were like blown away by the fact that people chose to pay us the same amount of money that they were going to pay Taylor Swift for, uh, for her concert tickets. All right. That means I get to tell you about hello fresh because with hello fresh, you get farm fresh pre portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You get to skip all those trips to the grocery store and you can count on HelloFresh to make home cooking fun, easy, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. With HelloFresh, it's great. No more scouring the grocery store for that one ingredient to complete your recipe. HelloFresh takes away all that hassle by delivering fresh, pre-portioned ingredients so you have exactly what you need. We've used HelloFresh a ton here at the house and one of the things I like the most about it is how collaborative it is. We talk on the show about how putting songs together and all that stuff is collaborative, and that's what makes that part fun. The same thing is true with HelloFresh, because if it's just someone making dinner, it's usually exactly that. Even if we're all in the kitchen together, one person is making dinner, and, and there's conversation, and that's fine. But it's not usually a collaborative environment. HelloFresh makes this collaborative because of their super easy directions. They give us these directions and one person starts on step one. The other one's like, oh, you got step one. Great. I'll take step two. And it truly becomes this collaboration where by the time the meal is prepped, the dinner table interaction and conversation is already happening because you've done this thing together. And there's no worries if you're not a pro in the kitchen, right? Because HelloFresh's foolproof recipes arrive pre-portioned and easy to prepare in just a few steps. And because you're a Gig Gab listener, we've got a deal for you. Go to HelloFresh.com slash GigGab16 and use code GigGab16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. So that's HelloFresh.com slash GigGab16, code GigGab16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Thanks to HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit for sponsoring this episode. So, Paul, that monkey fist gig that I played on Saturday night was at a private club here in New Hampshire. And what that means is people can smoke inside the club. Ugh. Yep. Uh, and we knew this going California. in. This. What's that? 
Not in California. Well, not here in New Hampshire either, but private clubs. Like, like if you have an Elks club or a, a you know, a, one of those lodges or whatever, a private organization, I, I'm, I mean, I, your state laws might be different, but, um, here you can't smoke in any public establishment, but because this is a private place, they can. So, and I thought that was kind of true nationwide, but it maybe not. Uh, but anyway, here that that's the case, you know, the American Legion and the Elks clubs and those sorts of places, people can, uh, people can choose to smoke cause it's private, you know? And, um, so it was the first gig that I'd done in a smoky bar in a long time. And I wasn't, what's that? How'd your voice do? Well, that was what I was wondering about. It was a four hour gig. We were playing from seven 30 to 1130. I had had a gig the night before and I, I was wondering how I do. And with monkey fist, John sings the leads and I sing high harmonies above him all night long, like every song all night. And I'm like, well, this'll be interesting. So we start out, everything's fine. And my voice lasted all night. I was like, Whoa, still got it. You know? Um, and John was having a bad allergy day and he texted us earlier in the day and said, you know, if it weren't for a few factors, I would just cancel this gig. But I, you know, I know some of the people there, I can't really do this to them. And and so let's do it, but let's see how we do. So he was going in already kind of, you know, uh, uh, down a notch. He was great for the first two sets, like no issues whatsoever. And then we went up for the third set and that's when his voice just gave out and it was like, Oh crap. Like, okay. And so I wound up singing a couple of leads. I actually grabbed a guitar and played a song, you know, it was just, but we had already had them in the palm of our hands by that point. So it, like we could have done no wrong. I mean, I'm sure we could have found a way to do wrong, um, but, <laughs> uh, but we, we do, we did not intentionally do any wrong. And so it was fine. You know, it was all good. I, I sang that, uh, that cracker song, uh, camper van Beethoven song, uh, good guys and bad guys, which is fun. Three chords and the truth. So, you know, I can, I can <laughs> stumble through that, but, um, and I was super proud of myself. I mean, I came home and, and I, I opted to put my clothes straight in the washing machine instead of burning them. I left all of my gear in the garage. I didn't put it in the studio. Like I remembered all the important things to do. Although, even at this point, I still need to go and unzip my microphone bag and let that air out because otherwise I'm going to hate myself forever, yeah. forever. Right. Yeah, exactly. I'm just going to buy a new microphone. Um, and then I had an uptown rehearsal the next day and man, that's when I paid for all the smoke and I I'm still paying for it a little. I can feel it now while we're doing the show here. Like I couldn't hit any harmonies. I mean, I hit them, but it wasn't comfortable and it didn't sound good. I sing lead on one song in Uptown. I sing Rocket Man. And normally it's like butter and makes everybody's heart melt. And on Saturday, it just made everybody's toes curl. It was just, or Sunday, it made it, it was just awful. And uh, I was like, yeah, okay. Well, now I'm paying for the smoky bar last night. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. Like, I mean, I, you know, I, like all of, like many of us, uh, you know, in our fifties and even forties, I would assume we grew up playing in smoky bars and it was no big deal. And we did it multiple nights in a row, but, um, I am not used to that anymore. So it was, I, I was, I was glad I made it through Saturday night. No problem. But, uh, I guess I should, what's that? But I paid for it on Sunday. Paid for, for it, sure. Yeah. 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 I don't, I can't even imagine trying. I mean, yeah. It, yeah, just throw me off in so many ways. Plus, I don't, I don't think my voice would last. So, yeah, crazy. yeah. I like I yeah, said, yeah, I was, some people do it, right? Go to Las Vegas. Some people do it. It's the thing. Yeah, yeah. I remember though, like we. So I've been in New Hampshire eighteen years. When I was in Connecticut for about five years before that, and then Austin for six years before that. Austin was one of the first cities to ban smoking in bars which I know for people who live outside of Texas and don't experience only experience the caricature that is told to you about Texas, that that's hard to believe, but it made a lot of sense um, that Austin was one of the first. And by the time I moved from Austin to Connecticut, they had, they too had banned smoking in bars. So it's like it, once, once I experienced it in Austin, it was just, you know, it, it sort of carried through. Yeah. And then I moved up here 
And every state in New England except New Hampshire had banned smoking in bars, but New Hampshire hadn't yet. It took them about two years uh, after yeah. we got here to do it. And I'll never forget, I, you know, I started playing gigs shortly after I got here. I was playing down on Hampton Beach, which is kind of a touristy trap of, of New Hampshire. And we'd get to the third set and I was like, I couldn't sing as well. And I'm like, oh, I must have developed some allergy or something. Like it just didn't dawn on me that it was the smoke. And then we played a gig with the same band. I played down in Massachusetts, you know, 10 miles away or something from where I was playing in Hampton beach. And I got to the end of the night and it was like, Oh man, like this is great. The, my <laughs> allergy must have cleared up. Like I still did. It still didn't hit me until I was on my way home and I crossed the state border. And for whatever, at that moment, I, for whatever reason I was like, Oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I think I know what the problem is, like, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's, I mean, it's bad for us. Like there's, there's a reason they ban smoking inside, you know? Sure. Yeah. I, it just kills me. Well, hopefully it doesn't kill me. It baffles me that people still choose to do that. And I, and I know we have some listeners who still, still choose to smoke and, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to, it, I'm just baffled. I, it just, uh, it doesn't, yeah, I don't know. It's not my thing, I guess. I have my own vices, so I'm yep, sure some sure. of the things I do baffle you folks. So I don't know if they only knew. Yeah, that's see, that's the difference. Is is I get to choose what I share here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things I, I I I don't know where this came from. Somebody was commenting me to me about a photo they saw of a band I'm in, and they were like, "Man." I, you guys look really good. And I'm like, well, that was a, a, you know, a pro photo taken by a pro photographer. I'm like, wow, that makes a huge difference. And I thought, you know, I got to put that on the gig gab list. Huh. It, it makes a lot of sense to pay somebody to do a pro photo shot, pro, photo shoot of your band, do it at a gig where you can get some, you know, like staged shots before the gig of just the band together, but then also some shots of you playing pro shots of you playing versus taken by someone who's not a pro using their iPhone shots of you playing world of difference. I, I actually don't know about that one, Dave. I'll tell you why. So many shots of you playing will end up out there, right? Yeah, that's fair. So many. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, yeah, really, really good ones, really creative ones will be different, but I would actually, if I, if I was going to use a pro photographer, it's just for that pros promo for the pose promo shot yeah. that, that, you know, gets sent out for bookings. That's that to me is a social media has brought the level of expectation, sound quality, video quality, photo quality. The expectation is that you can just see something, hear something, you know, get the feel of very general feel, super good quality has to, you know, I, you'd like to think it just automatically rises to the top, but if you're scrolling through 20 pictures of a guy making, you know, guitar faces, the one great one will be, I think it's going to be hard for it to stick out. So if I was to use, I would use it for the pure promo stuff, not for the, you know, just the sharing on social media. Hey, we played a gig tonight. I, yeah. Unless you're, going to do it, unless you're going to do it every time and your official releases of photos are always going to be really good. But once you add in reposting photos that other people have taken of you and it's that kind of like noise level of social media sharing, I would, you don't, you don't, you don't see that with pro bands. You know, if they, if they hire a photographer to, to follow them on tour somewhere, you only see the good stuff. Yeah. And the overall impression that you get from that is very different than the kind of barrage of social media posts. Maybe, maybe, well, I, I, maybe I agree with you. Maybe I disagree with you. I'm not sure. Um, with fling and bitter pill, we generally only release this isn't a hundred percent true, but it's probably 90% true. The pictures that you see of us are pro quality yeah. pictures. Yeah. Well, and, pro quality that you guys are determined, but, but they were taken, you're, you're resharing things that fans or audience people have seen, but you're, you're no, no, no. When I'm the saying the 90%, I, I'm talking about photographers that we have hired to come to the game oh, I see. and yeah. take pictures of us. I think that makes a difference to me that if the only official thing you yeah. put on your site is, you know, creates the brand and mm -hmm. image that you want, you're careful about that. Yeah. That makes sense to me. But if you're 
Like anytime you play somewhere and if somebody posts something about it, you know, everything that everybody, you know, take captures of you as fair game to put on your feeds. I think that it's hard for the really good stuff to, you know, pop it. Just maybe, maybe you know. that. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying, I, I think I might, I think we might actually be in agreement here. It just turns out that at least the two original bands I'm in by, and there are certainly exceptions to this rule where we will take, a, you know, a picture that, that someone just took with their iPhone and share it. But by and large, the pictures that we are sharing are taken by pro photographers, but you have to be smart about this. Just like, you know, it reminds me of when we had Davis Thurston here talking about how you record, you know, you video record the whole night, but you don't, you might stream it that night, but you don't then just release the whole stream because no one's really going to watch that and it's going to dilute the message. What you do is you chop it up and then you, you know, carefully choose when to release this song, this snippet of that song, et cetera, et cetera. And the same thing is true with these pro photos. When you have someone come to your gig and it would be, I, I recommend having someone come to multiple gigs, maybe not multiple gigs in a row, but yeah. you know, if you're playing whatever, 15 gigs over a summer, have them come to three of them and then hoard those pictures, put out a few after the gig and save the rest and then slowly dole them out so that you've got more content coming all the time. But it's this, yeah, high quality content. And that's what we were doing fling. And, and that's what got someone's attention. I think it was a fling, but again, we do the same thing with both fling and bitter pill. And it makes a huge difference. I think to have really like the difference, if you, you know, sit in a B, uh, you know, like you said, the social media noise, iPhone picture, and don't get me wrong. iPhone cameras are, are fantastic. Like they, they do all kinds of, software magic yeah. to capture low light photos the right way. And all, like, it's amazing what kind of software they've got in these things to actually make these crummy little cameras look good. But you know, when you compare that to someone who's taking, who actually knows what they're doing and is taking them with a much larger lens and understands how to balance light and all of that stuff. And it, and not only understands it, but is literally there intentionally to do that. And it's not just like, Oh, Hey, that's cool. Let me take a quick picture. You know, yeah, makes a difference. Um, and, and then, and then use those though, dole them out slowly so that you've got, you can kind of manage that's that. Smart. Yep. Yeah. I think we are in, in violent agreement here. I think, I think it's, yeah. it's like good quality stuff. If you are exclusive to the good quality stuff can make a difference. Yes. Good quality stuff mixed in with bad quality stuff will make a less of a difference. Yeah. Agreed. I, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I think there is something to be said for that pro quality picture appearing amidst the social media noise, whether it's your noise or someone else's noise, it's all just noise, right? It's like iPhone picture, Android picture, iPhone picture, Android picture, iPhone uh, pro picture, you know, it doesn't like, I, I think they stand out either way, but I agree with you that if most of what you're posting is, you know, smartphone pictures that does set the, the bar for your brand and, and yes, a pro picture will stand out above those, but it doesn't change the image of your brand because most of it's just smartphone pictures. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a, there's a, a music fan in, in the Bay area, super nice person takes pictures of, of bands and posts them. Right. Yeah. But posts literally every, everything that they take. I mean, mouth open, bad angles, you know. Oh, no, you got to edit. Up. Right. You got to throw but, away the crap. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, this is social media. They're right. like, no, no, no. Right, this right, is right. the amount of effort I'm willing to give to this. And at the end of the day, you know, it's not, I don't know. It's, it's, is something better than nothing, I guess is the question. Is all, is, oh, is, that's a good any, question. is bad press, is all press good press? Huh. Um, I, I mean, boy, I think there's nuances here because if you have, if the, if the options are nothing or something, then something I think is better than nothing. Yeah. How, however, if that's where you think you are, stop and breathe for a second and ask, are we really choosing between, you know, something low quality and nothing 
Or is there a world where we could choose to pay a a photographer for a night and get the difference between nothing and something great? And maybe it's worth a few hundred bucks to do that. Even once a year. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm I'm fascinated by as 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 social media is out there, you know, now quite a while. Yeah. I wonder if like in all other aspects of life whether the pendulum will swing and there's a point with social media where less is more. So, mm-hmm. you know, the house rockers have have changed a lot. We don't play every weekend. I have gone, you know, a couple of weeks without saying anything and when I choose what to say or post just to let people know we're still going, it, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty purposeful about it. And I try to be purposeful about the images that I accompany, you know, with posts. And, um, but I just wonder, you know, if, and again, I, I, I told you, I, I once pulled the audience. Like, are, are you people tired of, of every single person you follow that's, that's a musician posting not only every gig that they have, but everything that happened at the gig and, and every time, you know, they, they wash their hands and, you know, like yeah, is yeah, it yeah. too much. And overwhelmingly, people said, no, love, love seeing everything I can about the musicians that I choose to follow. So I was, I, you know, just thought that was interesting. But I, I wonder if there is a less is more aspect to social media as it becomes so prevalent. I mean, I know, I just think that there's, I just think it's a lot. And I wonder if you, I wonder if you can cultivate a brand by being that careful and purposeful about what you share. I'm sure the answer is yes to that. I mean, that's how brands cultivate is by being intentional and purposeful. And well, it depends what you mean. You know, if, if your if your purpose of your brand is to catalyze your image, that's one thing. If the purpose of your social media is to, is to get more, whatever it is, more gigs, more followers, more fans, whatever it is, that might be a different strategy, right? We, Again, I, this could go way off into the into the weeds here, but yeah, yeah. you know we we're at almost four thousand Facebook followers. It is our, but it they tr- it trickles in now. I don't do anything to get any more, but we have more than most, not more than everyone, but it trickles in. And our engagement when we post something on I post something on Facebook, it's pretty good. You know, almost yeah, pretty consistently, it's one to three hundred you know uh, interactions, and it's pretty good. But we, it's not a lot of new people coming, so. To some degree, everyone who, you know, in this geographic area that uses Facebook could have found us. They've kind of opted into us. And so I have been thinking about the conversation. I don't want to be the same as every other person or group that posts, you know, every time they eat a banana, you know, that, that, that's newsworthy, right? So, so I don't was know the if banana, my engagement... Was the banana, like, ripe or was it green? I want to know. Depends. Depends. If you want to know, then you're answering the question, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> Anyway, so I just, you know, this, I, I, I like where this thread goes, like hire a good media product, you know, hire a, 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 so once a year, have someone do a great job with a multi-camera shoot of a, of a really good stage that you're on yep. and, you know, spool those out every couple of weeks for a time and, you know, package them, you know, do whole songs, splice up four or five songs together, you know, just use that for a while. That's a cool strategy to me. Really good photos. That's a cool, you know, Richard Karras, you know, Richard, right? Richard's a great guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Richard is a great drummer and a great photographer. Yep. And that's the other thing is like, there are, there are, there are people who have a good camera and there are people who are pretty good photographers or good photographers. And then there's good photographers. And then there's Richard. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, people who know what's happening on stage is a moment to capture. People who know. Richard Richard has captured bands that, everyone knows of even yeah. people who don't know music. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He's, like and he's Rolling a Stones guy. and Todd like Rundgren. Stones. Yeah. He's got some yeah. pictures of Charlie Watts that uh, like, uh, yeah. Uh, untouchable. He sold a picture of, of Keith Richards back to Keith, I think. I think or, that's right. Or, or gifted him. Yeah. Richard, Richard is a great human being, yeah. super drummer and, you know, just an incredibly creative person. Yeah. And so I've, uh, you know, Richard is, photographed the house rockers for many, many years. And it's my go-to, but the thing about him that, that is so great is that he's a drummer and he gets yeah. what's well, happening on stage. That's interesting. The guy we have photographed bitter pill most often is a guy named Jay Fortin and he's a guitar player. And I hadn't thought about it. Like 
I mean, I thought about it in terms of whenever he's at the gig, like he's very comfortable backstage with us because, you know, he hangs backstage when he's playing like he, you know, he, he gets it. I had never thought about the fact that he's a musician as being the reason, one of the factors that contributes to him being a great photographer. He yeah. happens to also be a great photographer, but because he's a guitar player, he gets where to be in those moments to capture those things that other people might not even think about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I just hadn't, hadn't thought about it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. I don't know. It's uh but I think it's a good thing for your band to do and then think about how you're going to use it. And, and sure. maybe, maybe our conversation was helpful and maybe it meandered. I don't know. <laughs> as all, as all of them seem to do. Do they? Yeah. Well, I, all of them are one of the two, right? They were either helpful or they be under. And it depends on the uh, particular audience member, which way it went. So. Yavel, you got anything else, man? My voice nope. is shot. Like, like I think that I'm still paying for that smoky gig 48 hours later. It is what it is. Yeah. More? No. I think we're good for today. All right. Yeah, I'm good for today too. Thanks for uh, thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Thanks as always. You know, send in your stuff. We actually have some some comments and questions that you sent in to feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We haven't gotten to them yet. We'll get to them next time. I think we're taking next week off. If my memory's right, but, uh, what's that thing we do? No matter what, Paul. Always be performing, people. 